So you've had a, well, I'll start with thanks again. Um, uh, thanks to Moshe, thanks to Tony, thanks to Adriana, thanks to everyone else who's made this conference possible. It's been worth the wait, I think, uh, despite all the various hurdles that had to be met, obstacles overcome along the way. And uh, it's a real honor to be on this panel, particularly with a group of colleagues who I admire and respect and I learn from every day, including today. So um, it's also a little tricky coming in you know, after these people. It's hard, hard acts to follow all of them, yes? And uh, we've had the good cop, the bad cop, I guess you'll have the weird cop now, because I'm, <laughs> I'm an anthropologist and we tend to say the things from elsewhere that, that sort of, uh, <sighs> rub against the grain of conventional ways of thinking. That's our, that's our expertise, if you will. Um, and you might look at this title and worry you're gonna have a sort of anti-tech rant coming at you. I'm quite capable of ranting and I might, but it's not gonna be about anti-tech stuff. I think technology has a lot to offer to climate mitigation, to finding climate solutions. Uh, but I wanna press on this issue a little bit of this idea that what tech can do for us, you know, this idea that tech has an almost salvational uh, role to play in terms of dealing with the climate crisis because I think that's where we wanna have a more nuanced understanding of the relationship between technology and social institutions and dynamics. And part of that is actually thinking about why we have such a faith in technology to begin with. And that's a really, really interesting story. And it's quite distinctive to Western civilization in a lot of ways that uh, if you go back to um, modern Western civilization, I should say, because you have to go back to this period, this really important period in European history between the late 17th and late 18th centuries when a massive amount of wealth is flowing into Europe from uh, plantation economies in the New World uh, to service this emerging global economy. There's an industrial capitalist economy that's, that's taking shape and booming in Europe during this period. And <clears throat> along with that uh, comes a new political worldview, a new social worldview that we, we know as liberalism, European liberalism. So you think of everything from John Locke through to Adam Smith, that whole, that whole arc. And that liberalism has a really important and interesting and consequential mythology within it. And that mythology is that God gave uh, humanity the world as commons and all of its resources, but that God wasn't satisfied that it lay fallow or waste. The original meaning of waste was undeveloped resources back in the early modern period. And instead, the idea was that what God wanted was for humans to continue to develop the productive powers of their labor and of their resources in such a way as to sort of further the progressive impulse of the divine. Um, and that meant that technology had a really important role to play in terms of fulfilling our civilizational mission, if you will, uh, that uh, having greater uh, powers of labor and greater ingenuity with how you applied your labor was actually both a way of accomplishing this divine goal, but was also a sort of a symbol or a sign of one's place within God's grace, right? The technology was a blessing through which you would develop these powers. It also became an alibi, interestingly, for how European colonists then argued that the process of dispossession of the non-European peoples of the world, of their resources, was actually a Christian project. Um, because otherwise it might have seemed unchristian to take away uh, other people's right to move in the commons. But our technology was better. We were making more of the resources that were bequeathed to us by the divine. And as such, technology has always been something that's very overdetermined with an almost sacred status in our society. And I, I think it's important to sort of keep this as a backdrop for thinking about climate tech and green tech today, which is kind of the area uh, of... of, uh, of technology that interests us the most, I guess I would say, in this panel. So um, again, because of my distinguished colleagues, I can kind of yada yada certain slides in my deck, which is great, <laughs> focus on others, more that are more distinctive. Uh, here on the left-hand side, you see an image that shows us that a lot is happening, a lot is being done, more technology and diplomacy is being deployed with each passing year, and yet thus far at least, we're not able to really move the needle where we need to move the needle, which is on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. We may get there. It may just be a matter of time, but we have to acknowledge to ourselves that thus far what we have been doing hasn't been working, and if you look at the curve, it almost looks like it's accelerating rather than decelerating. Um, also, um, when we think about the stakes um, and want to focus especially on these social stakes here, and I think I can use a digital pointer here, 
forced migration, social unrest, political extremism. These are not theoretical things that might happen in the future. These are things that are already happening. And so much is happening politically that I think it's, it's, it's really easy to forget things that happened just a few years ago. And it strikes me how little I think about the Syrian crisis of 2015, the rise of ISIS. This was sort of game changing in terms of American politics, wasn't it? And yet it's something that's almost dwindled in terms of our attention and our consciousness vis-a-vis -vis today. Um, but this was a remarkable event when half the population of Syria was displaced. Twen half of a national population of 22 million people were put on the move, and some hundreds of thousands of them ended up in Europe, where they actually moved the Overton window in Europe significantly towards the populist, nationalist side of things as people became increasingly concerned about how would Europe manage all of these refugees. Um, and uh, it, it empowered authoritarian nationalists like Viktor Orban in Hungary, and it meant that even sort of like hardcore liberals, you know, centrist liberals like Angela Merkel in Germany had to go against their own conscience and sort of strengthen uh, Germany's border policies to restrict um, further in-migration of migrants. And the reason all this might matter to us is if you remember, um, the, what provoked that crisis in the first place was an extended period of drought of over five years when there were several uh, crop failures and a lot of Syrian farmers became desperate and they began to move to Syrian cities. And there they created new kind of economic and social crises within the cities and made the cost of living for the urban poor very expensive. And that led to further unrest. And then um, that unrest was responded to, unfortunately, by the government with violence. Other ge geopolitical players got involved too. There was the broader context of the Arab Spring, as you remember. But in essence, the, the kernel of this, you could argue the catalyst of this was a climate problem that actually fits very much in line with the kinds of longer term climate models that Sylvia was talking about earlier today. And part of the reason I think we've forgotten about it is because every year brings a new story, a new season of fire and flood and, and drought uh, and desperation in some part of the world. Most recently, of course, this summer in Pakistan, where I think something like 75% of the country was uh, flood affected at some points during that crisis. Um, my thesis, um, which I've already, I think, sort of disclosed my hand a little bit, is that overwhelmingly, I think, uh, in terms of both climate mitigation and adaptation policy, we're looking still towards sort of tech fixes for what are very sticky, complex social and often social structural problems. Right? And technology is good at a lot of things. It's not as good as it thinks it is at fixing social problems, though. And I want to talk more about that and show you some cases of what I mean by that. But just here, in very broad terms, but I think very relevant terms, we haven't mentioned the word capitalism yet so far, which is kind of astounding if you think about it. Right? I think at some level, intuitively, we know that the carousel is slowing down. Right? that we're not going to be able to continue to maintain the type of capitalist economy that co-evolved with fossil fuels. One that involves every, an idea of economic health and welfare that is tied to growth. Growth in production, growth in consumption, growth in transaction. Um, we have, we have a, a, an economic and, and more broadly social system that's predicated on a sort of hallucinatory construct that it's possible to infinitely grow on a planet with finite resources. And we know it, you challenge anyone that rationally, so of course, you know, something's got to change at some point. But, but it's, it's deep-seated, it's an unconscious desire almost, and we're dealing often with irrational as well as rational factors in all of this. So one of the things that we've tried to do is to think if there's a kind of technological end run around that problem and say, well, okay, we've got this problem with emissions, production emissions, consumption emissions. What if we can find ways of decoupling our economic activity from our emissions profile? And this is a phenomenon known as decoupling. And the whole premise of green capitalism rests on decoupling, I would argue to you. If we can't decouple, then the idea we can main maintain capitalism and capitalist growth in our conventional understanding of it together with some kind of a transition to a low carbon modernity is, is not gonna work. Um, and they're good, there's a really exciting area of economics called ecological economics that I would draw your attention to. It's a rapid growth field. A lot of really brilliant younger scholars are getting involved in it. And they've been hammering into this issue of decoupling and doing, um, doing studies. And I have a link here in the deck, which I'm not going to go into, but I would encourage you to look into this area of research 
Just to summarize it really briefly, what the findings have been thus far is that it is possible to decouple. It's easier to decouple from production than consumption emissions. But if decoupling is really hard to achieve, it's really hard to maintain, there's a lot of backsliding, there's a lot of recoupling that happens, even in countries that have decoupled. And in part, a lot of that has to do with this kind of constant growth momentum. And um, uh, even when decoupling can take place, its impact is much less than we'd like to see in terms of eventually trying to bring down those scary hockey stick type dynamics that we see everywhere. Um, what we need probably is to take something more seriously that the IPCC has just begun to talk about in its most recent reports, which is degrowth, sorry, um, degrowth as a phenomenon. I'll leave that there because there's a lot to say about it. I don't really want to make my talk about degrowth other than to say degrowth seems to be to be something that has to come within the realm of political conversation and social transformation so we can begin to move away from this model of resource use without conscience, energy use without conscience. That's a term that uh, my colleague, fellow anthropologist David Hughes at Rutgers likes to use. Somehow we have to sort of shift our political thinking, our values, as well as our behaviors, um, to be capable of actually enabling technology to do what it wants to do and can do for us. And it can do a lot. Um, it can do a lot. And if you look at some of the watershed moments in technological development, at least with regards to climate mitigation, you can look at the 1940s and the birth of atomic energy. You can look at the 1970s and the first flourishings of modern industrial renewable energy too. Both of them were in some way or another reacting to crises. One could argue Atomic energy wasn't driven exactly by the Second World War, but it certainly was brought into a certain fruition by that war. The 70s boom in renewables was certainly related intimately to the oil shocks of that era. Um, but in both cases, uh, I think we have to admit to ourselves that um, the technological possibilities, though wonderful, were stymied by entrenched social and political interests that made it possible for, well, I mean, Nuclear is complicated. <laughs> nuclear had safety considerations. There's a lot of issues with nuclear power, what to do with the waste, that, that again is a huge Pandora's box. I don't necessarily want to open right this second. But to say that also the nuclear energy um, transition was actively resisted by the oil and gas industry very successfully. There's all sorts of evidence of how the oil and gas industry funded anti -nuclear, anti nuclear movement in the 1970s and the 1980s. And then when these tragic events like Chernobyl and Three Mile Island happened, we're able to use those as further proof that there is no sort of post fossil modernity to be dreamed of. And we know, you know, uh, Carter put the solar panels up on the White House and Reagan took them back down again, right? <laughs> sort, of, sort of guaranteeing us a doubling down on a fossil economy that has become so interwoven with state power, not just in the United States. Uh, when people talk about petrostates, I'm like, what state isn't a petrostate? Any state with a military is a petrostate at this point. The point is these incredibly entrenched and powerful interests have to be taken into account here to understand the possibilities of technological uptake and development. Um, but we keep dreaming, and I mean, this is one of my favorite match cuts in the history of cinema, right? From 2001, A Space Odyssey, the bone flies in the air and becomes, uh, becomes the space station. Uh, beautiful work. Um, we have a social sort of understanding of technology that's still very indebted to that early modern period of liberalism where you know, we see it as progressive, we see it as inevitable, we see it as something that will increasingly lend humanity power to control both nature and culture. And I'll get back to the nature issue in a little bit, but on culture, yes, technology impacts culture. I'm not gonna sit here and tell you, you know, the sky isn't blue. Obviously it does. But on the other hand, technology's capacity to engineer culture change is much more limited than it thinks it is. And I'll tell you why. First, it tends to, um, to lean into a variety of instrumental reason, means ends thinking, that conceives the world as a world of means accomplished via tools. I call this implementational reason. And so in that world, we've heard about the parable of the person who's got a hammer and everything looks like a nail. Well, in this world, it's just hammers and nails all the way down. Um, and of course, there are things, there, there are analogies are places where that analogy works pretty well, and a lot of them 
where it doesn't. Secondly, and very importantly, and I think in some ways Rick has just spoken to this too, there's a tendency to discount social relations and institutions and political hierarchies within sort of technologically driven narratives of change. I found that tech determinists have some of the worst theories of power I've ever seen. They tend not to really understand how power works and why power, how the capacities of power to maintain itself. But again, you know, coming from a place like Houston, I think we should understand the resilience of entrenched power our interests. And finally, although this isn't always the case, oftentimes, especially in the sort of Silicon Valley tech disrupt culture, uh, which is an important part, if we're honest with ourselves, of the kind of energy transition these days, there's a tendency to think uh, or believe that most people in the world think and act the way that Silicon Valley elites do. And I call this the web van fallacy. Does anyone remember web van? I'm getting a big A little bit? <laughs> Web van, look it up. Um, these people burnt through a billion dollars of venture capital like that. It was amazing how fast they burnt through their, their Series A. Um, but interestingly, they did it to, to provide a service that I think all of us today would say, this is a great idea. Late 1990s, the internet is just becoming generalized through the availability of web browsers. And they come up with the idea of you go online, you put it in order, and somebody drives your food to your house. It's brilliant. And it's ubiquitous today. The problem was they burnt through so much money building massive distribution centers all over the country, and only one of them showed any profit, and that was, you guessed it, in the Bay Area, right, where people were ready for the transition to a sort of internet-driven economy, not so in Alabama, in Tennessee, even in New York. And so it became a case where you know, they had in some ways seen the future correctly, but had misestimated the time frame because they were everyone they knew was ready to make the shift. Their social circle said, yes, let's all do this today. They didn't understand the complexity of different social situations that people found themselves in. So when people ask me, and I started my career not in energy and environment, but as a media scholar, and when people ask me, you know, what's the best book you've seen that explains the co-evolution of technology and society, I say, by far, Raymond Williams' book, Television, which I would guess many of you haven't heard of. It's an old book. It was built, published in 1974. But what was fascinating about his way of thinking about why broadcasting developed was that he linked it to this broader social phenomenon called mobile privatization, which was the breaking apart of large kin groups into smaller nucleated clusters that we would call, say, nuclear families today, and the mobilization of these families. Most, most Europeans back in the day were born, lived, died within you know, about 15 kilometers uh, of, 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 of radius. Uh, but people began moving widely uh, beginning in this early modern period, and it was because uh, of the labor forces that were needed for modern industrial industrial capitalism, it, it, was, it was very fortuitous for those uh, interests to have a mobile labor force that could move to the sites where production was needed. And in some cases, like in the case of the Highland Clearances in Scotland, when people wouldn't move willingly, they were forced out um, and forced to move into urban populations. But the, the, what happened with so much mobility was that it was difficult to pinpoint people when you had to give them crucial pieces of information. So broadcasting was a way in which you would just sort of spray the landscape with messages. So wherever people were within a certain area, they would get the message and you would give them portable receivers like a cheap transistor radio and that would allow them to get the vital social information that they needed. Um, Looking at this model for understanding how broadcasting developed, Williams then brilliantly turns it on his head and says, how's TV gonna develop from here? And he, with like uncanny accuracy, predicts the next three decades of television's development. He predicts the rise of cable and satellite broadcasting, of pay-per-view, of interactive TV, and a lot of other things in ways that are really like phenomenal to look back on. And I say, if, if, any, if any model has that kind of predictive power, it's something you should take seriously. So I think, again, just as a suggestion for all of us to look at this book as a model of thinking about what technology is and how it develops. One thing that, um, that he didn't uh, foresee was the rise of the internet, which a lot of people would say, well, if you miss the rise of the internet, buddy, you, know, you don't have a good paradigm, um, except that he knew that um, within electronic communication, there was always, and I can't remember, was it Bill Fulton who said yesterday, the Victorian internet, you know, the telegraph, right? He, he knew that from the beginning, 
there was always this, uh, this sort of peer-to-peer -peer lateral potentiality within electronic communication, telegraphs, telephones. And in a lot of ways, what the internet did was it restored. It was the sort of the reverse oscillation swing from broadcasting, bringing back participatory, dense, peer-to-peer -peer messages of communication that, if, again, if you lived through the 90s like I did, and that sort of web van fueled uh, digital utopianism, uh, not just web van, but you know, other things, like Amazon too, which survived, uh, like web van. Um, so you heard that the internet would change everything. It was gonna make our uh, politics more accountable and transparent and democratic. It was gonna make our commerce more convenient and cheaper and easier. Um, it, it was gonna, I don't think they were promising transportation at that era, but inevitably, right, we get Uber and Lyft and so forth. Um, the point is, obviously, it transformed everything. The internet was a civilization changing force across the world, but not always in the ways predicted, not on the timelines predicted, and not always with the positive effects, because just to take you know, a, a current uh, anxiety that we have about what's happening to our politics, you know, there's a flip side to um, sort of this lateralization of, of media and bringing down the, the, the paywalls and the, the barriers to entry. And that's really disrupted our cultures of expertise. It's disrupted our institutions of authority. It used to be the case we all got the news from the same place and we sort of had a common pool of facts to discuss. It's really hard to have a political discussion when everyone has their own facts. Uh, we've, we've come to understand this in this country now, and this is part of the Thanksgiving dilemma we've been discussing. It's like, you got different facts. There's really hard to find common ground. But this pluralization of, of veridiction, of sort of truth-making uh, capabilities, has everything to do with this new kind of information ecology that we're living in, which has you know, some really positive sides, but also some really dystopian sides too, especially when you put it in a sort of, for, put huge areas of the internet under the domain of corporate interests that are trying to sell clicks, they're trying to sell attention time, and, and they're doing that oftentimes through algorithms and, and, and bots and so forth to sort of help guide you to where they want to see your attention going. All of that has a lot of negative consequences at the same time. I say all of this as a sort of prelude, and it's longer than, a, it's a, more than a prelude, I assure you, um, uh, to, to talking about green tech, because I think green tech is finding itself learning some of the same lessons that the digital utopians of the 1990s have found too. There's a, there's a tremendous promise in the sort of technological deployment of low carbon uh, possibilities for climate mitigation, for tech-driven climate adaptation solutions at the same time. But a, a real, from my view as an anthropologist, a really serious carelessness when it comes to the social side of things, either outright disinterest in the social side of things, or again, the sort of web van issue of sort of assuming everyone thinks like middle class Americans about how they use their stuff. And that has led to situations where green tech innovations, often very positive ones, ones that have a lot of possibility, have actually not only underperformed, but have actually exacerbated some of the problems that they're trying to solve. And I want to give you two cases of this. It's not just me ranting, um, although you can see where it's coming from now. Um, so one uh, case is off-grid solar lamps in Kenya. And this is not my research, but the research of a dear colleague of mine, Jamie Cross, at the University of Edinburgh. You know that um, energy access is a real issue in sub-Saharan Africa, um, it's expensive, it's not reliable. Uh, e even if it's there, uh, it's intermittent in many cases. And uh, so, you know, a popular tech fix for this has been the creation and distribution of, of cheap, portable off-grid solar lamps as a solution so people have a little light in their house, children can do their homework at night, maybe a, another business could be started up, something like that. It sounds good, and again, not without its potential positive benefits. But unfortunately, the design of a lot of these artifacts was that they couldn't be repaired. Uh, the idea is people would recycle um, these lamps, uh, not realizing there wasn't a lot of infrastructure for recycling in places like Kenya. But what there was, was an incredibly deep and talented reserve of artisanal labor of people who kept things running. Because the expectation in Kenya, as in many places in the global south, is when something breaks, you don't throw it away you open it up, you fix it so it keeps running. And there are sort of famous cases of this, like the 1950s automobiles in Cuba that are maintained in your pristine condition through these incredibly sophisticated and engaged uh, care economies. Um, and uh, this was a problem in becoming a serious e-waste problem 
in Kenya where there were millions of these lamps going into landfill within just a few years. Uh, again, something that people there hadn't asked for as a price to pay to have a, a solar lamp, which in the best case scenario seemed to have an operational life of between six months and a year. So what to do about it? And this is a case where there is some sort of happy news to report that Jamie, working together with local artisans in Kenya, working together with designers based in the UK, was able to develop a repairable solar lamp called the Solar What? And I've got the URL here for it if you want to check it out. That was um, not, uh, it was not, it's not under a private property license. It is free. It's open source for anyone to download and, 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 and produce it if they care to. That could hopefully, over time, perhaps uh, provide a better type of solution to this issue, be part of a solution at least. The second case I want to talk about is my own research, uh, together with my partner, Simony Howe, 16 months of field research in southern Mexico between 2009 and 2013, looking at the on-the-ground politics associated with the construction of what was at that time the densest concentration of wind parks on land anywhere in the world. This is in the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, the southern part of the state of Oaxaca. And um, again, uh, a lot to, there's a lot of good ideas in this project. Uh, Mexico had some very aggressive uh, uh, clean energy targets under President Felipe Calderon. He's sort of remembered as the guy who, uh, who so, sort of oversaw Mexico's descent into a lot of gang violence and narco-terrorism. But he was at the same time uh, the former minister of the environment and doing a really, really good job, I think, of um, trying to address the uh, really serious um, climatological issues that the country faced. So this model, um, was to develop the world-class resources of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec using a PPP, public-private partnership model, um, using a, what's called industrial self-supply contracts, where a, a Semex or a Walmart would contract to a developer like a, an Iberdrola or an Acciona Energia to develop a wind park. Uh, the, the argument was it was win, wins for all, wins for the project investors, wins for um, wins for the companies who are, who are um, organizing the contracts, wins for the government in terms of being able to have new infrastructure built for them, and of course, wins for the local communities who are seen to be getting the benefit of these additional land rents. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't actually so rosy how it all turned out. What happened instead was that the communities experienced a decline of local agriculture, which led to a skyrocketing of local food production. Uh, it led to... Um, uh, sort of fencing off of a lot of common areas, sort of a sort of reverse common scenario, privatization. Uh, it led to um, a lot of enhanced social inequality because the only people getting money from these projects were the local landed elite class in the first place. They were already quite wealthy. And rather than reinvesting those funds back into the community, what they tended to do was sort of invest in prestige consumption for themselves, buying a second house. I'm sure there was private jet travel involved, um, all sorts of things that really didn't raise the, raise the sort of the, the, the floor of, of social um, opportunity in this area at all. And it was sort of tragic because Simone and I went to this part of Mexico. We went into this research, like really hopeful, really optimistic, really sort of interested to see how it would all play out with a lot of optimism ourselves. And then it was really sad for us to see that within a few years, uh, people were talking about wind energy as basically just like mining. They would talk about it as a dispossessive extractivist measure. And what, the, what we sort of, in this image, which is from a, a home in La Ventosa, uh, one of two towns now entirely encircled by wind parks uh, in southern Mexico, um, I think it says a thousand words, right? You know, just these, these husk-like wind turbines presiding over this desiccated landscape with this indigenous boy sort of trying to get the last little bit of nourishment out of this depleted corn stalk. It's really tragic. Um, and the lesson of it is, <laughs> if I can be blunt, that it's possible, like renewable energy is entirely necessary to the kind of uh, sustain sustainable modernity tradition we're hoping to accomplish, <coughs> excuse me, but it is not adequate. 
Uh, and in fact, you can build wind parks and solar farms in just as extractive ways as you can dig oil wells or mines. Uh, and people saw that the people were not uh, deluded there as to what was happening. They really saw themselves as part of a new predatory resource frontier. And this is something that I think comes up a lot when people worry about what happens if we push for you know building as many solar parks and wind parks as fast as possible, regardless of local consequences. People feel like in this part of Mexico, the global north has come down here to solve their problems on, out of our hides. Um, we are not the people who have driven greenhouse gas concentrations. Our, our use is so much less than even the average American, let alone the billionaire class, which is not just American but global, who have carbon footprints, this is according to an NPR report I heard this year, as much as a million times that of the lower 90% of, of human beings on this planet, right? So this is a situation in which, um, uh, you know, we have to think about equity and justice issues, which I know we're gonna talk about more this afternoon in real detail. So again, to kind of come back to the, the, the main point here, uh, technology is great, it should get better, I think it will get better. Um, everything we've been hearing so far in Dan's presentation is really encouraging in that way. Look at this heat pump data, Dan. I got it right here for you, right? Uh, latest data from German heat pump uh, performance. It's looking really good in terms of how these technologies can help. But the, we have to be honest with ourselves. The obstacles to where we want to go are not technical obstacles. They're social obstacles. They're obstacles of institutions and values and habits and worldviews and political relationships and imagination. So the ability to imagine imagine a world other than the one that we currently live in. That's, those are our bottlenecks. And to deal with those bottlenecks, I, I, I'm, I'm beginning to believe quite deeply that we have to sort of lay aside some of the tech utopias and begin talking more about infrastructure instead. And the nice thing about infrastructure as opposed to technology is that infrastructure isn't a tool, it's a relationship. Something is infrastructure to the extent that it enables something to happen, usually in the future. And when you think about that relationships of enablement, you begin to sort of frame the question differently. It's sort of not what tech fixes will let us sort of circumvent our social complex thorny social issues, but what kinds of relationships among humans, and that involves you know, our relationships here in this room, our relationships at Rice, as Rick was just suggesting very provocatively, I think, in great ways, uh, Rice in the city, um, the global north and the global south, uh, everything urban-rural, all sorts of kinds of human relationships that need to be considered, but also our relationships between humans and the non-human world. And I've thrown up here one of my current micro-obsessions in Houston, which is digging rain gardens. I'm gonna get back to that again in a second. Um, Houston, uh, it's where we are. It is an infrastructural powerhouse. I think it's the most powerful city in the world. I think it is. I think I can't really think of another city other than some of the finance capitals that could claim to exert so much influence on how the rest of the world operates than Houston. We can own that here. We should own that. Because right now, we have a machine that's set up for the reproduction of the Energo environmental status quo. Things are happening a little bit, um, but not nearly enough, I think, in my opinion. We have been an infrastructural innovator for a long time. Uh, I love to look at the history of Houston to sort of see how before oil and petrochemicals uh, dominated the economy. There was cotton and steamboats and railroads. The whole rationale for Houston's existence and thriving has always been because it's an infrastructural center that carried on into the middle of the 20th century as, as a sort of intensification of petroculture spread across the world. But Houston was an innovator in the making of suburbs, in the making of highways, uh, and uh, also also in terms of climate control. But of late, I think our infrastructural questions and politics here have really come to focus on issues of climate infrastructure. And there are two kinds of climate infrastructure that I want to talk briefly about, got it. Um, uh, gray infrastructure, which is a kind of way of thinking about infrastructure that's pretty technological, frankly engineered human material designs that have predictable kinds of effects, um, often using high energy materials to guarantee those effects like concrete and steel, often being very expensive and large scale. So they take a long time to uh, complete and they also sort of put the, 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 if you will, the steering wheel of guiding the future into the hands of people with massive amounts of resources, so the wealthy class. Green infrastructure is a little more is a little more heterogeneous what it's meant. Usually the idea is you want to bring nature in as an ally in the process of solving problems. But in that 
problem-solving allyship. A lot of times nature is made into kind of a series of tools we add to our tool belt. So there's some kinds of green infrastructure projects like those wind parks in Oaxaca, for example, that maybe are a little more gray than they pretend to be. Uh, parenthetically, I looked really long and hard to find something that was green on the outside and gray on the inside. It's really hard. There's no fruit that I could find. I say pear, but that's obviously. So if anybody figures that dilemma out, let me know. Um, and I did research uh, myself on the, the emotional uh, consequences of repetitive catastrophic flooding in Houston after Hurricane Harvey. Um, and I found that you know, gray infrastructure logics really do dominate here, everything from personal infrastructure projects like elevating homes in Meyerland through to regional gray infrastructure projects like Project Braze here, you'll see. Um, some examples of uh, the sort of the channelized water courses from Project Braze, uh, beautiful new bridges that sort of reduce, uh, uh, reduce drag, and then all the way up to the kinds of speculative watershed engineering projects that the US Army Corps of Engineers engages in. The Ike Dike that we may get when? 30 years from now, probably. That's always 30 years from now with gray infrastructure. Um, and I won't talk that long about it, but I'm happy to circle back to it because I'm running out of time. This, um, deep tunnels. I have a lot to say about deep tunnels. I'm very suspicious of this as a solution to our problems. And some, some folks at Harris County Flood Control off the record shared with me their, their feeling also that these are extremely expensive, but probably not very effective solutions. But that's kind of what gray infrastructure does. It always looks for a sort of tech solution, no matter how expensive, no matter how unlikely to succeed. And my colleague, uh, Adriana Petrina, calls this diligent insanity, which I think is a good way of thinking about a lot of gray infrastructure projects. Instead, uh, perhaps we can imagine what kinds of infrastructure, a different kind of infrastructural utopia uh, to deal with the fact that we are going to face a massively rising water, it seems, like where Harris County is in terms of rainfall increase. So I'll end with this. Uh, this is my uh, sort of final thought, is uh, a thought experiment inspired by Art Story, who was a visionary public infrastructure director for Harris County. I never met him personally, but we have a friend in common, Keiji Asakura from Asakura Robinson, who said that Art used to say to people that, you know, if we would just, if everyone would just dig a water catchment in their yard of maybe two by four by six, we probably could put Harris County flood control out of business. And that's a really interesting way of thinking about the problem. Instead of Project Braze, a 30 year, $500 million project, you know, what if we were to imagine, what would it take to dig a million rain gardens in Houston instead, and what would the impact be? And again, without going into great detail, the impacts, you can, you can kind of make it work. You can kind of make it work if you dig, if every, uh, if every uh, house, housing piece of housing infrastructure has a rain garden about the size of what we dug in Trinity Gardens this year, that's about two billion gallons of detention capacity. You have businesses build slightly larger ones. Um, it's possible perhaps to do this, and if you could mobilize civic engagement around a project like this, uh, you could probably do it much more cheaply because the rain garden we dug in Trinity uh, costs nothing and took about a day to dig. So imagine that as a potential solution. Imagine if Houston were to declare a rain garden week, a rain garden month, a rain garden year, even five years. The potential impact could be the same for much less the cost than Project Braze. But this is, again, a sort of really thinking outside the box. And I think that's what we need to think outside the box on these issues. We need uh, to stress our imagination. We need to understand, I think, with a certain humility that there's only so far our technologies can actually help us if we don't address the sort of deeper social structural issues that are involved. And I do think that you know we have to sort of we have to, with a certain humility and seriousness, uh, take, take stock of our situation in the Anthropocene uh, and think about culture change as part of what we do. Thank you. So, uh, is there time for questions or did I, okay. Great, so, yes. Not, not, not leaving always, just displaced, sometimes within Syria, displaced. So what, what are the impacts of the U.S. sanctions uh, on that particular country that, that you can uh, talk about? Well, I think, I mean, it's so complex. This is where Syria is both a, a, an illustrative case, but there's a lot of other factors that are playing into it. It becomes a site of geopolitical... Uh, contests between the United States and Russia, obviously. Um, the, 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 um, uh, the 
uh, regime, which is both um, you know, supportive of, of some goals of the US historically, but also now sort of uh, in the doghouse. Um, you know, all of these factors that also, I think the context of the Arab Spring is a big part of that as well too. So I don't think the US helped the situation, but I don't think in some ways anything exactly would have helped the situation at that scale. This is the thing that worries me, is not just one country with a sort of mobilization of, of that many refugees, but what happens when it happens to multiple countries, including countries with a lot more people. That stress is going to have political impacts. It's going to make it much, much more difficult to do the kind of diplomacy that Dan's talking about. Thank you. Thank you. I, there's a bunch of hands. I don't know who, whose hand was first. <laughs> I saw one there, one there, and Dan, maybe he has a too. Um, so one of the reasons, I guess, why there is there might be resistance towards more of uh, social engineering approaches to uh, some of these problems might be a lack of trust that is just getting worse. Um, and also the feeling that I or me or my community is getting shortchanged by society. And um, so I don't want to do anything that can, like why should I do anything for the public good when um, I'm a victim? Right. So until those two things are addressed in some way, uh, it, it might be hard to convince the masses that you know something greater than the local good needs to be done and that's why i guess tech solutions are easier because often you just throw money at it and it works well whereas in the other case there is just a gridlock so do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, so many. And that's a great way to put it. You put it so elegantly, um, both in terms of saying there's a general kind of um, sort of a lack of faith in government to be able to maintain things. And again, I mean, I talked about the history of liberalism. Liberalism has engineered a lack of faith in government since the beginning. It's like one of the founding principles is skepticism about governmental top-down influence. And oftentimes, you know, there are plenty of cases that show that's a good skepticism to have. But we also know, and I think we've seen it locally too, with the resurgence of sort of locally grounded grassroots politics in Houston and Harris County in recent years, that that kind of mobilization from below, as especially when people come into the political class who are not born to the political class, outsiders, normal people get involved with politics. It can actually really change that dynamic. Um, so it's true, but I guess what I would say is it's, it's oftentimes the, the frustration is with a political class that's bubbled itself up, that's not listening, uh, and that, that sort of is listening only to certain elite vested interests. Um, I think that is totally true, but part of what we have to do if politics is the art of the possible is redefine what's possible, and that may be bringing new kinds of imagination and voices into the political system to do that. What effect do you think it has on the discussion when we emphasize the flaws in green technology? So you show the, the wind farms that cause problems in Mexico, but I've just gotten back from the Amarillo area where the agriculture extension, people are saying how it's helped farms stay afloat by having that dispersed among uh, agriculture or among grazing, which cannot be said of any coal mine. Um, yeah. either locally or the acid mine drainage downstream. There were flaws with that uh, solar lamps in Kenya, but if you don't build out the larger farms and grids, then the only other local solution to, or house by house solution to lighting is kerosene lamps, where even if they work perfectly, they're polluting indoors and using a fossil um, resource. And of course, you know, often have the things that point out the birds that have been hit by a wind turbine, which is less than a 10th per unit as impacts of fossil fuels, Solyndra that's become, you know, the, the whipping boy to, to discourage uh, investments in emerging um, clean energy companies. So I guess what, what is the hope in, in highlighting the flaws of, of green energy in a world where, where there are sort of inherently far more flaws mm. in, in the fossils 
fossil fuel alternatives. Oh, too. I, and I would agree with you totally, Dan. You know that. Um, and it's a it's a great provocation. And I want to be clear: it's not it's not, the flaw is not with green energy. Although, unfortunately, when people are victims of projects like what I described in Mexico, they tend to think all green energy is potentially problematic. But even in that case, there was an alternative project that was a community-owned wind park project that had total community support that would have redistributed half of its profits back into sort of local schemes. It was a beautiful model that was resisted tooth and nail by the corporate wind um, wind interests as well as by the Mexican state because there were sort of no kickbacks to be found within this model, frankly. So I'm not criticizing green energy. Like you, I 100% believe in re renewable energy and I like to lead with that point. But it can be done really badly. And so this is a critique of the development model. It's a critique of the interests that are being promoted over others. And I think the reason why it might work better in a place like Amarillo is it's, it's, being, it's, it's, it's in our context. Like it's in a place in which there is not a, a history of communal land ownership, for example. We live in a privatized uh, landscape. And that helps to sort of facilitate certain thinking about this in terms of market transfers and incentives that make sense to us that they don't necessarily in other parts of the world. So I'm asking us to, be, uh, to, to take the social context more seriously. If we're going to do these projects, to work closely with communities to make sure that their objectives are being met and their interests are being met, whether that's cheap electricity, whether it's about you know being able to sort of fund some social scheme like a local medical center or something like that out of the profit share. Um, there are ways around this, and in our NSF report, we wrote point by point all the things that could have been done better to reduce the social conflict because we really wanted to communicate. It's not, the, it's not a technology problem. That's the problem. We can't solve it through technology, but we can solve it through smarter, th smarter kind of social attentiveness and, and better institutional solutions in many cases. Please. So um, when you really are hoping for uh, climate change solutions, one of the things that always seems like the wind in the face is the people who are denying it and all of the pushback and the folks who say either humans aren't responsible or it's not our problem and things like that. And there's this sort of dream that if we were all on board together, we would move much faster and everything would be right. To what extent is that true? I mean, how much of the problem are caused just by people denying that it's a problem and how much are our own blind spots towards the things that are necessary? Yeah, I think that you know we, we probably talk a lot about the damage oil and gas industry has done to the environment through producing fuels, and let's also remember plastics that have this kind of waste problem in the environment. That's totally true. I actually think a much worse effect they've had is in terms of um, you. you, you um, Dana put up the Merchants of Doubt, you know, book in terms of. Uh, challenging climate science, undermining it, you know, bad faith questions, which is all in their own interest of slowing down the transition as long as they can, churning up, churning up the waters so that people who don't have the time to read all the relevant science sort of think, well, okay, it seems like we're still not sure what's going on here. That, I think, if we look back on this, is a much, um, a much more significant, serious, longer-term negative impact, is that kind of not just the putting emissions out, but really the, the, the creating, um, using the sort of the world of the internet to sort of challenge uh, authority of science in this. And I think that's, so, you know, I think that, that if that weren't happening, if, if the oil industry had done maybe what some of us utopianly wished for when they first began to understand what was happening, because they understood sooner than anybody, by their own internal projections, if they had said, okay, we really need to think about where we're gonna be 50 years from now, and we need to think about a managed transition, and we think about needing to develop, and bits and pieces, I'm not trying to demonize the industry as a whole, there's lovely people with conscience who've tried to do great things, oftentimes fighting against the same infrastructures and hierarchies that all of us um, see from the outside. Um, but in aggregate, these, these companies in this industry has done probably more climatological harm, you know, uh, than any other. Um, and it, because they're the most powerful industry on the planet, with the possible exception of international finance, it's hard to see what makes them change their behavior, other than sort of concerted political uh, will. And that's, I think, the new front line of struggle is how do we find the will to keep oil and gas out of the next COP meeting. 
um, how to keep their lobbyists away because they've had a chance to be good faith actors and they failed. They haven't taken that opportunity seriously. I think all of us would have wished they were good faith actors and it really helped with this process. But unfortunately, and again, I don't think it's a matter of individual moral uh, corruption or anything like that. It's just simply in how corporations are structured, accountable to their shareholders, not to the public. They're just doing what we've sort of set up these institutions to do. That's the institutional kind of intervention and political intervention I think that we need. So I know it's heresy to say that in Houston, but oil, the oil industry has to go.